All right. Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming to Open Hour. Uh, this week we're going to be talking a little bit about air quality and uh, air pollutants and air um, monitoring tools, and we have a variety of interesting topics this evening uh, under that that people are interested in, including um, hydrogen sulfide sensing, uh, silica, um, the Duskino project, among many other interesting topics. So um, if you're viewing this, uh, you can actually um, join us on the call live on the Open Hour page by uh, clicking that button there, which will direct you right into this call. If you'd rather just stay and watch, that's fine as well, and you can communicate into us through the chat room that's uh, listed right below the page. So um, thank you, everybody, for coming, and uh, really looking forward to it today. Um, and just for the sake of annoyance, I'm probably going to repeat how people can join a couple times. So sorry in advance for a little bit of redundancy. Um, all right. So the topic is um, air pollution and air pollution monitors. And um, Matthew, did you want to go ahead and start with a brief intro? Or are you in a good place right now for that? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if uh, if if no one objects, I could I could go ahead and kind of kick off. We should off. clarify. We have two Matthews. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, I I I, was, I thought I was number two on there, so I was kind of confused. But yeah. <laughs> uh, I, brother Matthew can go. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for the rapid change of venue. It just started raining. I thought it was going to be clear outside, so I <laughs> rapidly went for some shade. Okay. So um, let me just screen share. So I'm going to talk about um, silica monitoring and our current project um, there. So um, the 11th Hour Foundation has uh, funded public lab to do an exploratory project in um, the same uh, communities in Wisconsin in monitoring silica dust. And well, what is the problem? The, the, the problem is, is that uh, construction and uh, mining, in, uh, mining cause a significant amount of the dust in America. In fact, I'm dealing with an eye problem in my left eye right now uh, and had to rush going through this presentation because I couldn't use my computer over the weekend because a piece of dust got in my eye. And actually, a human being is probably responsible for that dust because at this point, uh, anthropogenic dust is the largest source of dust in the world. Um, and in Wisconsin, one of the sources of dust are giant holes in the ground, such as this. This is an uh, image credit from uh, Mikey O'Connor and uh, the um, San Francisco blog. And so if you notice, uh, off to uh, the left of the photo, there's a tiny little thing that is, in fact, a giant caterpillar um, uh, steam shovel. So when we're looking at dust, what are the problems of dust? Well, the problems of dust are when it gets small enough, it can lodge itself in our respiratory system. So the yellow range here <coughs> are, um, are particles that can get into your lungs from breathing through your, uh, your mouth and into deep into your lungs. And you'll notice that there's a peak at about uh, three to four. Uh, nanometers in, uh, in diameter. And here is the type of dust that is released during uh, mucking or dry drilling, so during typical mining operations. Now, as you'll notice, it corresponds almost directly to the type of dust which is really bad for you that can get deep into your lungs. So this is uh, John and Kristen Pierce's uh, team out at uh, UW Eau Claire deploying a whole series of different monitors. These are kind of the contemporary strategies for uh, examining dust and silica dust. Uh, John is setting up a dust track 2, which is a small particulate monitor. And I'll talk about how those work in a second, a light-based one. Behind him are a series of EPA-certified filter tests um, that suck air through at a very steady rate and try to collect particles at uh, filters that are specific to different particle sizes. So, <coughs> Here's Kristen Pierce holding one of those filters. You can see that the dust has settled down onto those little spots through the filter. There's also, uh, he's holding two vials in his hand on the, uh, 
left is unwashed sand, and on the right is washed sand. So uh, the companies are mining, washing, and separating out different grades of sand. And uh, by doing so, they are generating a lot of dust and sand that stays on site and can potentially go around, uh, blow around and cause uh, some serious health problems, including complications with asthma, and uh, 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 silica dust can also be carcinogenic. So there are a couple projects to monitor that that are already ongoing. This is a DILOS monitor. It's a commercial air quality monitor that measures particulates. Uh, and it costs about $200. Uh, Hank Boshian and uh, the Chippewa Concerned Citizen are using these to, uh, to do some citizen monitoring. And um, uh, um, Jeff Falk has been doing an analysis of that data. You can see more about that on the public lab site. I posted a little bit on his analysis. And uh, this is a Don Blair image. This is how that monitor works. It looks at a pulse of light. And uh, the pulse gets interrupted by a air particle going through. And that particle, the interruption, corresponds to a specific particle size, roughly. There are some, uh, some things to, that have to be checked there. Um, this is uh, Matt Shoyer we're talking about this. Betty Shoyer will talk about this later. This is the Dustuino. It uses the lower cost uh, alternative to something like the Dylos monitor. And it also uses a small light-based sensor, like this one. So uh, this is a Shinye sensor, and um, it uses a little focused um, LED photodiode, goes through, shines light through a lens, and uh, this resistor is a heating element that causes a continuous flow of air through the device, and uh, the diode, this, uh, the, the photodiode detects interruptions in the light. Uh, that's one way to look at dust. I'm getting really interested in another way to look at dust, which is, uh, this is a directional, um, what's called a sticky pad from dust scan. And uh, these have only thus far been used for what's called nuisance dust, which is dust of a variety of different sizes, not necessarily small dust. But it's essentially a giant piece of tape that picks up dust. Um, I was just talking to Thomas Peters at the University of Iowa, and uh, his group actually has some dust accumulation rubric that may be useful for this um, that, that are based on collecting dust in little tiny in similarly cheap sensors. I'm also looking at ways to monitor that uh, using uh, light. So a traditional way to distinguish silica particles has been um, polarized light microscopy. So here's a really quick uh, large scale polarized light microscopy. All the little glowing crystalline things are quartz sand crystals um, because polarized light causes them to glow in rainbow colors. Um, so those are the ways that I've been looking at looking at dust. We're also looking at supporting existing researchers uh, uh, such as Tom Peters' team uh, and uh, uh, Kristen Pierce's team um, in their current dust monitoring efforts and also helping out citizen monitors such as uh, Hank Boshan. So that's the state of our current dust monitoring. And uh, perhaps I can turn it over to Matthew Shore. He can talk about developing a tool, which he's been working on, the dust we know. Cool. Awesome. Th that's, um, that, that, that is excellent work. And, and uh, um, thank you for presenting that. And also going into the, um, uh, the Shinye. Uh, so... Um, which is which is what is at the heart of this dust we know which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but more than the technology, I think it'd be really neat to talk about kind of how this all um, came about um, because I, I have a background in a number of areas and, and it's kind of like how Public Lab has uh, people who participate also from a variety of fields, you know, environmental scientists um, and, and, and concerned citizens and hackers and stuff like that. Um, part of my background is, is journalism. I, I have a master's in journalism here from the University of Illinois in, in, a, in kind of specializing in kind of uh, data-centric journalism. And um, there's a trend now, thanks to kind of the lower cost sensors coming down the line and, and, and kind of hacker technologies like 3D printing and, and, and kind of open source uh, electronics like the Arduino and Raspberry Pi and, and stuff like that, that journalists can now not only um, obtain data 
from, say, like the EPA, but uh, rapidly approaching a point where we can collect our own reliable data, which, which is excellent when you see kind of the trend of EPA monitors um, being reduced uh, kind of nationwide. I know that's the case in Illinois and in Michigan and certainly with budget crunch issues. Um, quickly you can start to see how uh, there's a lack of information even from from government. So, um, and oftentimes governments don't place their sensors in an ideal location. So it's all a great uh, reason to start to look into how well, how can how can we create this stuff. Um, so uh, I I reached out to my network and uh, for for uh, a number of things. One is is uh, the Fab Lab, and I'm going to try to pull up a photo of the Fab Lab, which is just really uh, really instrumental in um, helping me create this because the idea was that um, so I mean th this could be useful for a journalist to sense particulates in the air but uh, if, if we really want to do this on kind of a massive scale um, without actually having to do kind of a full-scale production at a factory what you need to do is is harness the power of, uh, of uh, uh, the, the hacker communities and places like Fab Labs and uh, makerspaces, which is exactly what I um, tried to do t in developing uh, the Dustuino. So, um, as the previous photo showed, kind of like the, the construction of the box, which is kind of important. So, the idea here was to make something you could flat pack, almost like you know IKEA or something. But basically, it's these uh, quarter or eighth inch thick acrylic plastic sheets that you that have this really fine. Um, uh, teeth structure to them to just kind of snap into place to create a uh, basically a box for your sensor. But of course what goes inside the box? Um, initially we started uh, reading the Shinye dust sensor with um, a, uh, an, an Arduino and so that was always in prototype form but, but we've been able to take the uh, prototype Arduino, and since all this is open source, it's, it's very easy to go onto a program like EagleCAD, which is what I use, and to design just a custom uh, circuit board. So this is about two inches by two inches. Um, the idea was to keep the components down to a bare minimum. So you have the microprocess or the uh, the microcontroller chip, um, which is a, a run-of-the-mill at Mega 328P, the same kind of chip you get in in your Arduino Uno, um, a, uh, a voltage regulator to, to help manage the voltage, um, a programming port so you can hook it up to the computer and reprogram if necessary. Ideally, you just program it once and then run it basically until it quits. A port to install the, um, the dust sensor, which is installed in this right now. Um, this is actually the Shinye sensor itself. And, and probably the mo one of the most important parts is, is a radio module, which is uh, just very small. It's about the, it's, it's this size. This one actually connects to Wi-Fi. Um, so with that, you can, you can send your data off to Zively um, or ThinkSpeak or you know, the, the new SparkFun service. Or really, it's, it's meant to be open, so you could even set up your own server at home. Um, and so the idea was that everyone, you know, could make these in their homes. Um, what really kicked off this idea for me about getting, doing this on a wide scale was uh, back in um, 2012 when I was, when I'd already made a prototype of this stuff. Um, I had a, a friend of mine who uh, got a new camera and was out taking photos one day. And uh, not far from here, a town called Hoopston, Illinois, um, there was a, uh, a tire a used tire depot that uh, caught fire. So basically a million tires um, went up in smoke and you could see it um, from from space. Uh, it was just such a massive tire fire. And I think I have a photo here I can share. Um, it's It was just massive. Um, I'll have to come back to that later. But but the point is that, that um, so the people in this town Right, uh, we're, we're concerned about about the the air pollution because the EPA came in with their own monitors and said, "Well, this is not a healthy level of particulates. Everyone needs to evacuate from this town." Um, and I later tried to dig out the numbers to see, well, what what exactly? What did they read? What was what was the readings that was making the EPA say that it was it was uns unsafe for people to to live there? And so I filed FOIA requests. I did all kinds of 
uh, you know, I, I went down to the EPA office in, in Illinois and or in uh, Springfield, Illinois, and, and got their state EPA documents, and, and not one of them had any kind of uh, uh, quantifiable data on the airborne particulates. Just none. No information whatsoever, but it was a big decision because they evacuated this entire town. What I did find was a bunch of emails and letters from concerned citizens. There was one from uh, the superintendent of the schools there and warning the law. Our school starts up here shortly, and, and, and is, this, is this a health hazard for our students? Um, you know, this soot is collecting in our feet, and children are tracking it indoors. What's you know, what's going on here? And and even I, spending months on FOIA requests and following up with the state's attorney general to try to get the IEPA to respond to this, if could not find the information. You know, it was kind of uh, an epiphany. Like, well, if if the state's not going to collect this stuff and, and and save it and give it out, then then who is? Um, so uh, that I mean, that that's a concern not just for uh, you know, journalists who are trying to do environmental reporting, but also people on the ground um, who want to collect this for themselves and make their own decisions. Um, so that kind of led to a lot of this stuff as well. Um, also teamed up with some environmental journalists who wanted to know just about that. So I've been building some solar sensors, solar powered dust sensors to go out to Mongolia. Um, and they'll be there over the winter to measure uh, the kind of uh, pollutants that you get from burning uh, wood, coal, organic and organic matter for um, for heat. Um, so that's that's kind of where the project is at this point. We uh, open source all of the results online so that you can build one yourself. We on, on, on Public Lab we published instructions on how to build one in prototype form and we're gonna follow that up with instructions on how to build solar type ones. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll be happy to answer uh, any questions about that project and, and just I guess carry it off to the next person. I was on mute, sorry, hazard. <laughs> um, great, thank you so much. Um, actually, we, we do have a question right now from somebody who's in the chat room. Um, and I, we can do a few questions, um, and then we'll, we'll maybe move on to a couple others. But um, how do these low-cost sensors compare to the EPA um, sensors? And I guess that's a question for probably both Matthews. Um, well, I, I could I could say really quickly the way the EPA sensor the current EPA uh, methods that are approved are all filter based methods. Uh, so there are particulate measuring methods such uh, such as these uh, uh, light based sensors, but it all has to be correlated to a filter that collects the particulates, but then run through uh, either a mass spectrometer or X ray uh, spectrometry system in order to identify the particulates and identify the sizes of the particulates. So that, that, that's the current, those are the current EPA accepted methods. Um, and uh, the EPA seems open right now to expanding the definition of what they're, they're accepting, the type of data they're accepting. But that, as of right now, those are the current EPA accepted data. So any sensor such as the Dustwino or something to get the kind of um, officiated data, I would say, not high quality data, but officiated data, would have to be correlated with one of those EPA uh, filters, probably within the geographic region it's operating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's the, one of the biggest, uh, well, I'll, I'll add that the sensors are, are much better than what they used to, to be, especially for the price point. Um, but uh, there's also a lot of, there's a number of hurdles as, as uh, as Matt was referring to, because um, EPA collects things on on those filters, they um, they weigh them. Um, you can you can find out uh, uh, what kind of dust, the, the composition of, of of the chemicals that might be there for you know, for instance, lead um, could be in that sample. The the sensors that we work with, the the, the low cost stuff that we're working with right now. Um, as was shown in, in the image, is, is basically optical in nature. So instead of taking that sample of of the dust that was collected on um, on the filter paper, we're just we're we're shining basically an infrared light inside of a tiny box and trying to measure uh, how the, how that dust uh, reflects or um, changes the light in, inside that box. So um, these sensors claim from the factory that that they will they you can interpret a, a particle count. 
um, from from those uh, from their methods. Um, there, th there's a number of issues with just measuring the particle count as opposed to measuring the actual dust um, in those other methods because uh, you don't know the composition of what's in there. So it, it could be something uh, much more carcinogenic than, than you would know because you wouldn't have the, the dust to actually uh, study. Um, but uh, t we, we, try to, we try to get around that just a little bit. Um, in our Dustuino code that we have for... Uh, for the Dustwinos that use the Shinye sensor, we've we've tried to look at a, a number of studies that uh, that, that tell us it, um, kind of kind of uh, what you would expect a certain um, particle count to equal in kind of the EPA or EU standard, which is micrograms per cubic meter. So you're basically converting converting from a particle count to to a mass concentration by assuming that that the particles are of a mean size and that they're a, a mean density um, and from that you you can you can try to convert that so there there's there's error in each step of that that way from counting the particles to try to you know uh, to you know and, and estimating an average size and estimating an average density for those individual particles um, but what we found in, in in kind of laboratory testing with more expensive equipment including uh, Dilos and and kind of the filtering traditional filtering method is that that these sensors well uh, we, we don't know the composition they track pretty well with uh, what we see from more expensive units especially if you monitor something over over many hours um, which is what the EPA does it's generally a 24 hour standard um, is what they look at so um, if you're not looking uh, at, at, at smaller time frames. Um, then you tend to get better results from that average. So that's that's kind of the, the limitations that we're working with with this right now, and the ways we're trying to work around it. Great, thanks for the response to that question. And I see you've joined us now, David. But I was just going to read your comments, um, and you can correct me if I mispronounce it. Then just that the EPA has a federal equivalent method um, that works on detection principles other than gravimetric. Um, but you can speak more to that now that you're, I think, on the call here live. Yeah, sorry, I was having trouble getting on, getting on That's live. That's fine. Yeah, so I mean, the EPA does use methods other than gravimetric. In fact, a lot of the um, when you see the um, AQS mart, the air quality um, online data, that's um, pretty much in real time. Um, you, you're obviously not looking at the gravimetric monitors. Um, they really use the gravimetric monitors for quality assurance, and and when you have an area kind of on the cusp of attainment or non-attainment. Um, those are always the, the final final determination. But for the most part, um, a lot of the data you see online is real time. It'll be um, the T ohm, the tapered element oscillation method, which is like a like a vibrating filter. And then the other method that's commonly used is beta attenuation. So it's like beta being a type of radiation um, going through a filter. Great. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to check here. Um, there's been a link to an example of community dust uh, monitoring project that's posted on the chat page, and it's gcmonitor.org slash coal report uh, C-word. And um, Scott, I think you posted that. Um, and if you want to go ahead and, um, po po I don't know, do a research note on that so we can learn a little bit more about it, that would be great. Um, and there's a new... Um, Okay, Sarah, looks like you're on the chat here on the page. Great, all right, everybody's good. Um, so we've covered a good bit about um, dust and a little bit about um, silica. And I know that we have some people here who are interested in hydrogen sulfide and hydrogen sulfide monitoring and uh, sensing. So um, Sophie, do you want to um, talk a little bit about the project you're doing? And um, that'll leave us some time um, I think there's another one after you, and then we can have a, another discussion. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Sophie. I'm a student at Grinnell College in Grinnell, Iowa. And I'm actually doing this as part of a summer research project on CAFOs, or confined animal feeding operations, so basically factory farms. And we're working with a group at the University of Iowa with Peter Thorne, and we're going to study how CAFO emissions affect 
people in the nearby community, so within about one mile of a CAFO. So initially what I was doing with my project was looking at how it affects people's moods and quality of life. And so the IRB was taking forever to approve the project. And in the meantime, I was looking on Public Lab, and I found this method of hydrogen sulfide sensing that was originally developed by Claire Horwell, and it was used on volcanoes in New Zealand. And I thought, well, CAFOs give off a lot of hydrogen sulfide, so maybe I can apply it to this, to CAFOs. And so I did a sample run. I made a couple batches in the lab here at school. I, um, I also developed a little a box. I made a research note on these. These are lightproof boxes because it, it uses photographic paper and the paper um, reacts with the hydrogen sulfide and darkens. And so I made these boxes that are lightproof but they allow air in. You put the film canister with the sensor inside and I tried putting these in a small hog farm, well, relatively small. It's got 1,200 hogs in it, so that's considered to be a relatively low nuisance compared to the other ones. But I, I um, last week we went back and got papers back, and I found that it does indeed work, which has been confirmed already. But what's exciting about this is that it works for CAFOs, so we can use this. <laughs> Fire! <laughs> So this was this is the one that yeah. was outside of my house, and these two were in the barn. And so now the next step is figuring out if we can get it to if it um, detects hydrogen sulfide levels at or below 30 parts per billion, because 30 parts per billion is the legal limit in Iowa. And so we tried um, this method where we use um, emergency water storage bags and put the strips in there and. Um, use syringes to get hydrogen sulfide into the bags, and I posted this on the research note as well, but it was very inconclusive. I think it might have been because the, sorry, that wasn't fast enough, the, um, the strips were kind of jostling around inside of the bags, so the coating that is required to activate them may have worn off, and also our methods for syringing hydrogen sulfide into the bags were kind of sketchy. So, now we're kind of just waiting for the University of Iowa team, and we're going to deploy uh, the homemade sensor side by side with their sensors, um, which it, which are radiello, which uses methylene blue, and that will be hopefully a way we can we can try and quantify it because that's the that's the criticism we've gotten the most that's not quantifiable. Although I do like I think yeah someone's also pointed out that just the the dark discoloration is very powerful on its own. So we're going to, yeah, it's going to be a couple of weeks now. My housing permit is running out, so I'll be home. But I'll be back in the fall working on it still and looking forward to it. Cool. Thanks a lot, Sophie. That was, that's really yeah. awesome. <laughs> I love the box. Can you show it again? Can you show the inside higher? Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you. There's 40 of these behind me. <laughs> <laughs> Just waiting, gathering dust. <laughs> oh, good. You're in the right room then. <laughs> can you hold it up one more time? Sorry, I couldn't see it. Yeah, no problem. I can link you to my research note as well if you'd like. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. But... yeah. Um, and then, uh, is Liz, is Leaf around? Yes. Yes. Let's get the video on. Yeah, can you see him? Is our video turned back on here? Hang on, just a second. Um. Anyway, so uh, it looks like the video is having a tr trouble coming back up, but can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right, so. Um, uh, my name is Lee Persfield. I've been a contributor to Public Lab for a little while now, and um, I've worked on all sorts of other different stuff. And um, I wish I had the video to uh, show you, because I have some stuff here. So maybe I'll play with this for one more second before I dive in there.
The end says it's fine. Oh, okay. Looks like the video, somebody says the video is fine. Uh, um, the, I think the video is fixed on the page. Did you want to, do you have a picture you were going to screen share, or what were you? I just have some stuff here to show you, but um, anyway, it's, it's not that big of a deal. So um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the Air Quality Egg Project, which um, is now a, a couple year old project around, um, you know, very much the same topic, distributed air quality monitoring. Um, and, and came about uh, as, a, as a, a kind of a meetup group actually here in New York and then spread to a bunch of different places in um, kind of all over the, the world really. And there were some bunch of workshops in Amsterdam. Um, we did workshops in London. And um, it's, it's tracked actually very well with some of the work that Public Lab has, has done. And there's a, uh, there's a research note from a derivative of the air quality egg uh, as, a, as a tool maybe. I don't even know where it is. Website, but it's it the um, the balloon-based air column monitoring sensor, or some ridiculously awesome name. Um, and it, it, the idea behind the air quality egg was to capture um, basic air quality parameters that you can get with low-cost um, uh, uh, sensors. We have um, a sensors on here for uh, volatile organic compounds, nitrogen dioxide. Uh, carbon monoxide and uh, ozone, um, and then as well as temperature and humidity, um, we use a simple uh, optical dust sensor um, in the form of either a shark or one of the uh, genetic sensors that's been discussed before. Um, but what the the real approach to this project and the the kind of the the striking success and catastrophic failure, maybe I should say, or I don't know if I'll go that far, but um, was was a successful Kickstarter where a thousand of these devices were sold and distributed throughout the world and had then the information get, get posted online in real time. Um, and the, the real idea behind this was not to create uh, an EPA level uh, monitoring system where we could accurately say we had a parts per million or parts per billion accurate sensor to say, oh, um, you know, the NO2 is too high and we're issuing an air quality alert. But the, the big picture idea was to have comparative data to say, based on two sets of data, you could say what sensor was high or low and what was reading high or low, what the trends were reading high or low. Because with a thousand of these deployed throughout the world, you could get a really good picture of what was happening. And, and so in, in some way, I think that that's still the biggest success of this project. Um, even though a, a lot has been kind of bogged down in terms of getting, uh, you know, measurable, quantifiable data that can compare to other different types of, of air quality resources out there. And um, Liz just pulled up. We, we went through, so speaking of the EPA testing, we actually had the air quality egg um, shipped off to North Carolina or maybe it was flat here in New Jersey. That's no, RTP. Yeah, so um, Research Triangle Park in, um, in North Carolina. They ran the full suite of tests against their, who knows how many hundred thousand dollars of equipment, laboratory um, quality equipment, and got the results back. And um, let's see, right, let me see if I can switch to screen share here, just so just so you guys can get the full effect of, uh, That's the speedy shield line. Yeah, if you run your mouse over the top, it's the green arrow, or the, the green box with the white arrow on the left-hand column is the screen share. And then if you pick the one in the top left-hand corner, um, that'll show your desktop, and you can minimize the Hangout and show whatever you, you want to show. I don't know. I'm on Liz's computer. I don't see it. But um, okay. uh, anyway... The, the long story, the, the short story of a long story, or the, the short answer to a long story, is we got our, we got our information back. And um, our NO2 concentration accuracy, uh, the, the, the test was the most successful because the test was 90% complete. And our accuracy is 10%, and our precision is 5%. Uh, so we are plus or minus 5% over 10%, <laughs> which is not so good. Um, the things that we were uh, sort of good at were the O3, uh, using our chemical sensor, we were 25% accuracy, but uh, with a 25% precision, meaning that uh, we were accurate within plus or minus our accuracy. Um, so, so there's some big 
gaps in exactly what we can provide in terms of data that is quantifiable in, in terms of, like I said, this, this EPA level saying parts per million or parts per billion in this sense. But um, the sensors themselves are manufactured um, to a specific tolerance, and then the components are put together uh, in the same manner um, so that we can basically guarantee that within the accuracy of the manufacturer's uh, specifications, our sensors would function uh, about that well. And, and then compare that to, a, to another set of the sensors, uh, you can say, well, you know, within, within any number of these air quality act devices that are out there, uh, they are accurate to each other. Um, and that was really the, the big success and the big, the big push behind this project, getting that out. And so uh, airqualityegg.org, um, the site, you can um, see uh, all the eggs that are online. You can check them out. Uh, hopefully they're still online. Uh, I haven't looked in a little while. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you. Um, I think that there, there are a number of questions that have been posted on the chat page here and on the chat page on Public Lab. Um, and some of you, I think, are on here. Um, and we'll just go ahead and, and start addressing some of these questions. Um, and Scott, I see your question up here first. Um, that Oh, never mind. That was a statement about your post. Right, OK. Um, Crispin Pierce, Professor Pierce, hello, how are you? Um, I see you have a number of questions here. Is your audio on, or would you like me to read them? Yeah, we can't hear you. <laughs> um, I think um, your, your audio is not coming through. I'm going to go ahead and, and read your questions. OK, great. Um, so Professor Pierce asked, um, and for the um, the uh, hydrogen sulfide uh, monitor, Sophie, um, mm -hmm. has ammonia, which is also emitted from the CAFOs, been considered for monitoring um, test strips available? Test strips, not they are available, yeah. OK, yeah, that's not something that we've looked into yet, partially because that's not something that has an established legal level. So it wouldn't really provide much of a much power to locals, and that's what we're starting with right now, but that would definitely be a good next step or a good place to go after this. Uh, um, Professor Pierce, I would love to see your uh, post for the or, or information about the test strips that are available. Um, yeah, I'd that, like to look at that too. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if you're on the Public Lab webpage, but um, if, you, if you could post that or send me an email, I can get it up there because it would be really valuable information. Um, we're dealing with in, in a number of places. Um, and also, just to, to note here that um, if anybody who's watching, I know there's a number of people who are just watching, um, you can post questions on the Google Hangout page if you're there, um, on the Public Lab chat page if you're there, um, and we'll get them. Um, so some, some of the other questions here are um, um, for um, Professor Pierce also asked, um, using IPD for organic vapors, was that for the egg? Professor Pierce, not for yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Leaf, can you answer that? Um, um, was it using IPDs for the organic vapors? PID, sorry, dyslexia is kicking in. PIDs. We the the organic vapors are, are basically just a um, get the book. So um, the the all of the um, sensors are metal oxide sensors. Um, and so it's basically just a little piece of reactive silicone that gets heated up, um, a little piece of metal that reacts when it's heated up and in the presence of that chemical um, changes resistance. And so they're, they're pretty simple and they're pretty cheap, but they do have kind of wild swings. And certain um, metal oxide sensors are actually sometimes more susceptible to other uh, compounds. Uh, in a similar uh, nature to the compound that you're actually trying to measure. And so uh, occasionally you can get noise based on um, input from a, a different compound that you're actually not trying to measure. So 
those those are sort of the the pluses and minuses. They're also really cheap compared. I mean, um, the whole air quality egg, I think, kick, was the Kickstarter was for $125 or 150 bucks or something like that, including an Ethernet port and wireless communication and all that stuff. So um, it was amazingly cheap and was about as good as it ever was. So Great, thanks. Um, and there was a question here, I believe, for you, um, um, Matthew S., as well, about the dust we know. Is it affected by humidity? Yeah, um, we the, the truth is we, we don't know because we haven't tested it for um, in a laboratory environment, uh, you know, controlling for humidity and looking how that changes over time. Um, but we do have so I, we have tested it in, uh, compared to some some other uh, more expensive units. Let me see if I can screen share to show you because um, it was kind of a really neat collaboration this 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 process because I ran into some people at a. Uh, uh, one of these maker fairs um, where I was presenting, um, and it was. Uh, let's see if I can't. There it is. I'm going to share this. So let's go into presentation mode. So um, uh, ran into some students who were trying to solve a problem for. Uh, I, I believe they they were uh, first year graduate students trying to, to find out uh, or do a study on kitty litter. So here we are in in a lab um, with a with a climate. Um, over here on the right is the climate. It's it's a much more accurate uh, unit, and we have one, two, three, four. We had five of these Shinye sensors lined up at the same time, collecting data all on a laptop. And um, we had someone who uh, disrupted the, uh, the the kitty litter. We were testing basically what's kind of you know what's what's best in terms of dust mitigation because there's a variety of um, kitty litters that that. Uh, uh, claim you know low dust and all this stuff and and here's a closer shot of all the Shinye sensors and and th this is th this is the result here uh, the, the paper that the students wrote showed that there was uh, some decent agreement so this blue line here represents Dustuino I'm pretty sure this is PM uh, 10 uh, the units are micrograms per cubic meter um, the red dotted line is from the climate and that is a bin containing uh, just PM10 alone, and you can also see there's a, a yellow dotted line here, which is the climate's uh, TSP, which I think I believe that's the total uh, measured um, from uh, I think 0.1 micrometers or 0.1 up to PM10. I'm not so sure about that, but that kind of shows uh, the all of the particles, not just the PM10. And you can see where uh, the Dustuino had a large spike. And uh, the climate kind of trailed after that. So um, there was some 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 decent agreement. We also went out in in the field and so to speak, and and measured actual litter boxes in in the real environments. And we Matthew, saw that. Are, yeah. Sorry, Tinder. Are you showing a graph right now? We're, oh. we weren't seeing it. Oh, it wasn't it wasn't coming up. No. Oops. Well. Um, I'm gonna not screen share then because that's I don't think no, that's working. I think it, we're seeing what you're seeing. Just click on the one that is the graph. Yeah. This one? Yep. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Uh, is, is it up now? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, this is the graph. So this is this is laboratory. This is not field. This is this is in our uh, in the uh, College of Aces, Agri Agricultural Sciences. Um, so I mean it it uh, it has spikes on the short term, but over over the entire period it, it tracked fairly fairly well. Um, so we were happy happy with those results, but we don't. We again, we don't know what the humidity is, and so that's that's one of the limitations there. If I if I could uh, jump in there, um, there is an article I'm going to post it into the chat room in a second that um, Willie uh, um, Willie Schubert actually posted uh, on the Shenye sensor. It's a pre-release study uh, from Berkeley called uh, uh, on 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 the Shenye sensor and um, they reported that there is a negligible linear correlation between uh, humidity and uh, and that optical sensor. Oh, okay. So they, they That's cool. Correlating for humidity data was important, but fairly simple um, oh. with the sensor. Cool. And uh, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if that that is similar to Crispin's experience with the dust track or other optical sensors, but um, it sounds like it. You you'd said earlier uh, that you had uh, um, calibration. You had some some calibration information on the um, the dust track, so perhaps it's a, a 
Here, let me let me let me put that in this this draft too. Sure. I think the the study uh, was done. Or what one of the one of the authors is Edmund Sato, um, at UC Berkeley, um, and uh, he's he's been he's been really helpful. Uh, Will, Willie Sherbert is from the uh, from the Internews organization, um, Environmental Journalist Network (EJN), and um, that organization has helped uh, fund some training exercises with with the Dustwino. Um, I made ten of these and taught journalists how to make them up there, and Edmund Sato was also working on um, uh, noise uh, detection equipment, so basically low-cost decibel logging uh, meters, and so that you, you can imagine a scenario where you have both dust and noise, and those are two big um, issues in, in an urban environment that, that can you know, harm your uh, quality of life that you could you know, work together on. Great. Um, there's a couple questions here for Sophie um, that I've been seeing. One um, from Sarah, do you want to speak to your question? Sure. Hi, Sophie. Great to see you. Hi. Um, I was just wondering about uh, two things. What levels of H2S did you use in that calibration test? Um, and I was interested in that gradient on the test strips. I've never seen that before, and I wonder if it's a side effect of the baffles. Yeah, that was uh, we found that very interesting as well. So the um, the calibration test, we were at 0, 5, 10, 20, 30, and 50 parts per billion. But so this was... 50 was your highest. Did you see 50 anything? was your highest. But again, there's probably something wrong with the method. It was a very experimental method, and we don't know what the levels were in the barn where we actually got the results. Mm -hmm. um, the gradient, I think, was because I've got a film canister to show you. We put the test strips in, like, oriented like this, and then later, talking to Elizabeth Wilder, we found out that they're normally, they go in like this. So that's how we'll be doing it from now on. Um, so yeah, we just think that the darker edge is probably it was the edge on top. So it was just it got more exposure. So that was a, that's a quick fix, hopefully. And there was another question online on um, on the chat page from Scott that says, um, could the film strip method be quantified in Photoshop with a histogram? Um, if that's similar to I mean, we're trying something with Image J, which is like kind of free Photoshop. And using um, integral integrated density, or is it integral density? Let me check on that. But it has to do with grayscale and how dark the scanned image is, and with the gradient, yeah, it was kind of hard to determine what exactly we were looking at. So I'm gonna. I was, I was just gonna say, Sophie. Uh, yeah, the the, um, the the histogram gives you an integral of the of the volume of the area underneath. The um, graph of a uh, of color intensity, so it probably it's it's probably similar to what you're doing. Okay, that makes sense then. Yeah, so I've tried that. Um, actually, I do have a small graph of that. I can try and pull that up and screen share. Bas well, basically, what it showed was that. It was zero on the white one and very high on the dark ones, but I don't know how sensitive it is yet. We'll need more data, but that's that's showing some promise, I guess. Great. Um, did other people have comments, questions, or um, thoughts on any of these topics? There's a, I'm realizing this is the air quality one was a really big one. <laughs> there was a lot of different topics. I see there's a number of links that have been posted on the group chat page. Um, if people are interested in following up on those on uh, research notes or even just on the public lab chat so that everybody can see them, um, then uh, we can share out some of this information that, that we've developed um, here. So, um, um, 
Kristen Pierce is saying, I think we all need atmosphere generators. $10,000. <laughs> Let's start and, a Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah. That would be a good, good Kickstarter. Yeah. Hmm. Um, well, I wanted to mention that um, here in New York, Jeremy Barron also just came in. He's an awesome... Yeah, our video is like, messed up right now, but... Um, Public Lab NYC member and dedicated um, Wikipedian as well. So, yay, allied open source community. Um, and uh, I guess, um, does everyone know how to stay connected with the air quality discussions on our listservs and on our website? Great point, Liz. I don't know, Stevie, maybe you want to go over like how sure. to subscribe to that stuff? Yeah, so if you go to publiclab.org, um, on the top center, there's a participate. I believe that's what the tab is. Correct me, Liz. Um, and then the third one down is join discussion list. And um, on the top is just a general public lab. It's published every week. We do um, updates. But for specific topics, on the left-hand column, there is one dedicated specifically to air quality. Um, and that's where a lot of these great topics and questions um, pop up with Public Lab and, you know, when we're incubating research notes and things like that. It's a really good group of people to bounce ideas and thoughts off of. So if you're not on that, I highly recommend joining. Um, so a really good group of people um, with really great ideas. So, all right. Um, and I have a note here from Professor Pierce that says, I wanted to extend an invitation to all who might want to test particulate monitors. We are using EPA FRM monitors for the lab and in the field um, and can co-locate the monitors, monitors for testing. Excellent. <laughs> I might send a couple of these your way then, if you don't mind, Crispin. Crispin Pierce, you're interested in the dust we know? Yes, appreciate that. Cool. I, I will. I will get in touch. Great, and I can connect the two of you. Thank you. Um, all right. Any other um, thoughts before we wrap up here? I was going to add one more thing about um, how to how to follow this topic very closely on our website. If you'd like to know when anyone posts a research note on air quality, um, you can just follow the link I put in the chat room publiclab.org slash tag slash air dash quality. And when you're logged in, you can see that you have the option to follow air quality as an RSS feed, so you'll get emailed if anything gets posted regarding air quality. Um, and there's many people that cruise the site and make sure that things get tagged properly. <laughs> um, you can also, we now are actually overlaying a question and answer format on top of our wiki have a bit of a stack overflow feeling. So you can also ask a question about air quality or sign up to answer questions about air quality um, by following the same link. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Liz. And before we lose anyone here, um, just going to throw out that um, Next week, we are actually going to, we're doing an open hour again on tools. It's been a really successful series, and we're really excited to announce that next week we're going to talk about thermal imaging and the, um, the fishing bob, um, and hopefully we'll have, um, I know we'll have some good presenters on, um, on that tool on the bob. Um, that's detecting temperature and water, and um, I've seen one of them created and used, and they're excellent tools. Um, so we're really excited about um, that next week. So um, I'll leave open for just another minute if anybody has any other questions. Um, but other than that, thank you so much for joining this evening. It's been a really great discussion, and these are really fabulous tools. And I, uh, I really appreciate everybody's time and dedication in joining and look forward to hearing more about them on Public Lab. Um, and uh, thank you all very much. Right. All right. Well, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.